Okay, today I'm recording a quick video on business process modeling with draw.io. The goal of this video is really to just give you a basic overview on how to process model, how to get started and start modeling right away. I'm not gonna go into super strict modeling notation, but I will talk about it a little bit so you can understand um, what some of, what might be out there for you um, and why it might be worthwhile for you to maybe do a little bit more studying on business process modeling. But for, again, for the sake of this video, we're just gonna try to keep it really simple. Um, the tool I'm gonna be using is draw.io. It is a free tool. Okay, let's get started. So if you wanna start with the basics of building a process model, especially if you want to learn BPMN notation, um, the first thing you wanna start out with is a pool. A pool is really just kind of the, the container for your model. Um, it is possible to create a model without using a pool um, and potentially for people to understand it. But the point of having a pool is to, to contain these things called lanes, much like a pool in real life. Um, a, uh, pools can have multiple lanes and different um, people, users, um, use the different lanes. For the sake of my example, um, I want to make kind of like a pretend um, loan application um, system. Um, this is not a real loan application system, and I'm going to be simplifying a lot of the different parts of like a real loan application process. Um, but the purpose of this is to kind of create understanding. Um, so it's more about teaching you how to use process modeling notation versus like teaching you how to how a real loan is processed. So let's zoom in a little bit here. Every process model starts out with uh, initiation circle, a general start. Um, so we're going to do the same here. Um, you can see in, in draw.io, there's a ton of different symbols. Um, for the most part, we're only going to be covering the first couple of each. And you can hover over all the different ones to kind of see what they mean. But chances are you're, you're going to have to take a course or buy a book um, on some of these nuances to really understand what it is that's going on. Okay, so back to our process model. And again, we're going to keep it simple. Um, so the first thing that happens, um, and let's, let's name our lane here. So this is going to be the customer. Um, when a customer logs into the system um, and initiates their, their, their loan process, the first thing in my mock system is going to be they're going to input their personal information. So we're going to go to um, a task shape. Oh, I, think I added a superfluous error there. Okay, a task shape. And we're going to say input personal data. Okay, that is, that is the first task um, for the user. This is an activity that they're doing. And when you're thinking about tasks, you should think about them in ways that are meanif meaningful chunks of activities um, that have some kind of impact in the chunk that um, that they're doing. So, for example, in this case, I could have independently put input their first name, input their last name, input their social security number and all of those things. But for the sake of this process model, putting all that stuff would be cumbersome and it's not going to help people understand the process any better. Um, so I just included input personal data that and over time what constitute personal data might change. So by leaving it at this level, you know, we could change the rules and say personal data includes X, Y, Z, or maybe it uses X, Y, Z and B in the future that we don't have to change the process model. We just know that that's what personal data means. Um, next, we're going to say input their, um, uh, the loan details. So the, the, the information about the type of loan they want to get. So again, draw Dino gives you this little shortcut. So if you click here, it lets you pick what, what type of item you want next. And I'm just going to go with another task here. Oh. So it looks like the first one's a duplicate, uh, to duplicate it, which can be useful if, if it's going to be something very similar. Um, I want a blank one and I'm just going to put it input loan details. Okay. So one of the uh, things that draw.io has on the desktop version that isn't on the online version, and it could be because of the processing power or whatever, um, on the, the uh, online version, if you click these arrows, it doesn't actually give you an option to select um, one of these shortcut items. It only would give you an arrow. So you'd have to have like um, another shape ready. Oops, that is not the right shape. Um, you'd have to have another shape ready and then kind of click the arrow and connect it. Um, so that's kind of one of the benefits of using the, the desktop version over the online version. But again, all these things um, work pretty much the same and it's really just up to you and, and what matters to you. So now I've input my loan details and now I'm gonna sub submit this um, into the system. So now um, let's add that uh, activity. So I'm gonna submit. 
Okay, so now as a customer, I've kind of finished my job, right? Everything that I want to do has been done. Um, so now it's, it's really going to transition into the systems activity. So we're going to add another lane for another um, um, entity, which is going to be the system. And it is important to have the system as its own separate entity. So people understand things that are happening kind of automatically or behind the scenes um, that like a person isn't having to do. And then a lot of times you might look at a process like this and say, hey, some of these steps could have been done by the system. So maybe we should build the new system to allow those tasks to be done within the system and a person doesn't have to touch it. OK, so we've submitted it. Now we want to move it into the system. So now I'm putting this task into the the systems lane. So now the system has to do some activities and we're going to say validate um, the details and validate might mean a lot of things. Uh, I'm keeping it pretty generic here, um, but validate could just be, you know, saying that the social security and the names match or the date of birth or, you know, addresses, whatever it is, it's, it's validating um, what's been input by the user, the customer. Let me zoom out just a little bit so we can see more. Okay, um, so here we're going to come to our first gateway and a, a gateway just means we're at a point where multiple paths can be taken. So if you're validating something, that means that validation could pass or fail. That means there's two potential outcomes. So it, it makes sense that the next thing that has to happen is a gateway. And the gateway is usually um, in the form of a question. Um, and in this case, is the information valid? And again, I'm, I'm simplifying a lot here, um, but valid can mean a lot of different things. I don't like the positioning of that. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with that too much. Um, keep it moving. So now, oh, and it's a question. Okay, and because th this is kind of a, a binary question here, so is it valid is, is really a yes or no and there should be a path for a yes or a no um, so in this case and i actually want to expand the width of the system just so i can make my model a little neater from a no path all right so in this case if it's not valid i'm probably going to want to kick it back um, to the user and let them know why it failed so in this case if it's a no I want to send a failure. Notification. That's what that's what the system is going to do. And you should definitely label your your path so people understand why a certain path might be taken. So if it's a failure, we're going to um, kick it back to our user, um, and chances are the failure is going to be about the input details. So we're going to force them to re-input the, their details. So that's what happens if, if it fails. If it passes, so all the information is valid, then we're going to rate the loan. Um, in, in rating the loan, and when I, when I say rating the loan, this is really talking about, you know, with credit scores and loan amounts and all those things, you know, what, what rating does the, the company give this this loan application and it's and what would it be qualified for so just to keep it simple i'm just going to say based on the rating is, does this loan qualify so is this qualified if it's yes we will give the the system permission to approve the loan so if you have a really high credit score you have a really high income um, and all of that information is valid um, the system is allowed to just straight up approve you. Um, and then once you're approved, actually let's give us a little more space here. Once it's approved, it's going to send a confirmation. Confirmation. Um, and then at that point, you as the user may have to actually confirm your loan. Okay, and then every every process ends with a similar symbol, very similar to the start, which is the general end. And so we're going to put that here and connect those two and say, once that loan is confirmed, this process is kind of done, right? So this is kind of the, the happy path of this, but we know we're not done because here we had a question, a gateway. 
um, and this was yes, but what happens if it's no? So in this case, if it's no, we're gonna say we're gonna have additional approver. So I'm gonna expand this, add some more actors um, into this flow. So we're gonna add another lane. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I do not like how draw.io uh, inputs the lanes because if I'm adding a lane, I definitely want it to connect you know, adjacent to all the different lines and be the full width. It forces me to do it manually in many tools like Visio and Bizagi. Go ahead and just make that lane fit within the space and you don't have to do it. But, you know, this is free and it still does everything. So, you know, there's only, only so much you can complain about when somebody's providing you something for free. So if it's not qualified, uh, we're going to go the no path here. Um, we're going to have to have somebody review the loan. So this person, we'll, we'll call them the loan specialist. Specialist. Okay, this person reviews the loan and, and determines if this loan is a special case. And there could be a lot of special cases um, and when we're talking about a loan, especially, you know, if you don't know what kind of loan type it is. So if it's a, you know, a car loan or a mortgage loan, there might be special cases. For example, somebody who just, you know, recently graduated, so they don't have that history of, you know, income that you normally expect in a loan application, but they know they're going to be making enough money to pay off the loans. That might, that might be something like a special case. Um, or maybe this person just straight up just, you know, has poor credit, has a poor history, doesn't make enough money. This person can't afford this loan. So this should be a question. In this case, if it's a no, this isn't a special case. This person just doesn't qualify. Then we're going to go ahead and den deny the loan. And this loan specialist has the authority to do that. If it's a special case, um, we might add another person who might be, we'll call them a manager, who has the approval ability to look at these special cases um, oops, and approve them. I have a loan for, loan for the manager, and this person also can review the, uh, the loan. Um, this is yes to special case. And they might decide whether this is acceptable or not. Um, so is this acceptable? And chances are acceptable is not like a subjective thing. There's probably rules on exactly what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. It's just that, you know, maybe they want a, a, a human to be able to check on it and kind of, you know, empathize a little bit on, on the situation and understand and kind of make a better judgment on whether they should be accepted or not. Um, and if it's acceptable or if it's not acceptable, they could deny the loan. And if it is acceptable they can approve the loan. Um, one thing I would add, um, you know, just if, it, if this was a real system, if you didn't have the loan, you should probably inform the user in that scenario as well that their form was denied. So in this case, you might say if the loan is denied, we want the system uh, to, to send that uh, denial notification. So gonna come here and we'll say the system sends that rejection and in this case because the process is kind of over regardless of what the user does I'll close it here but you can potentially have additional steps if it gets rejected for the user to kind of try again or go through a new separate process so again here if it's denied it goes to that same rejection so we want it to go to the same place so we understand that both of these um, denials send the same rejection, which leads to another end of this process. So this is another potential end. Um, and then this one here, the loan approval would um, end up sending another confirmation. So we do want to connect the two. Um, sometimes it can get a little messy when you have uh, complex models. Um, but let's see if we could try to clean it up a little bit. Um, make it a little, a little neater here. All right, and you can also, um, if I see if I could find it, um, decide how you want it to jump. So here, this line jumps, and I actually don't like that it's coming through this way. So let's put it over here. Yeah, that makes it a little bit easier to read, and you can decide 
um, how you want to do the jump to make it a little visually more easy to see that it's jumping and that it's not merging into this and going into send rejection. So from here, confirmation, end of process. So this is the full process, um, our fake loan application process. Um, now, this is what I would consider basic um, business process modeling notation. We didn't really use any special messaging or anything like that, and we completed the, the whole process. However, if you want to take it to the next level or potentially automate a process like this, then you will have to know some of those more um, specific types of gateways, specific types of messaging. So you saw that I used um, these events. There's a start event and an end event. But all these other events here are intermediate events, and they all mean different things. So, for example, you know, in this uh, scenario here where we, we ended it with the sense, sense of rejection, but there might be a process here that the, the user needs to submit. Um, but we know that that, you know, the user is not currently in the system. So it's not like as soon as we send that rejection, they're already here doing the next process. So what actually would happen is, um, you know, let's show an example here. Well, we could add this message here, um, whatever their next task is. So task, let me zoom in a little bit, make that easier to see. Um, but we know really what's happening is sending a message. And if you're automating this process, those types of things need to be clear. So you might use a notification like this to say this, there's actually an intermediate here, a message is sent, um, and that's how the user actually achieves the, uh, knows to start this task. So it's not automatic. They have to first get that message, then they might start the task. Um, in other scenarios, for example, um, here we're, we're reviewing the loan. Depending on the type of system and the, the type of process, in this uh, scenario here, again, this could be a message because the person, the loan officer may not be sitting at their desk all the time ready to get this message. So they might get it in the form of emails. And then once they see that message, they start processing um, the loan. And there's lots of different types of versions. Um, one type of gate that we didn't talk about here is, you know, if a, a task initiates multiple processes that happen at the same time, then you still use the same kind of gate, this diamond shape. However, instead of having a yes, no, you can use an inclusive or a parallel gateway to say either one of these two things are happening. Parallel means both of those things will be happening at the same time. So it's not a decision. It's just that when I complete that task, you know, person A is working on this while person B is working on that. And then when they're both done, that closes back up. Again, the nuances of those um, are really best served if you really study business process modeling notation. And that's like a full on course, not something I could do in just a few minutes. Uh, here on YouTube. Um, and I may make a more in-depth one in the future. Um, but if you want to pursue a more in-depth knowledge, knowledge of business process modeling notation, definitely take a course or get a book, um, read up on it. It's super interesting. And if you're interested in process improvement, it's something that could be very, very valuable for you. Um, and here's our process again. Other cool things to note, um, if you want to have like a quick style, it does have the ability to change the styles very quickly. Um, the default background color is not blue, but for some reason on my screen recording software, it gets a little bit washed out. Um, so I made it blue so it'd be easier for you to differentiate my boxes versus um, all the different pieces. I hope that was helpful for you guys to get started on business process modeling. Um, if you have any additional questions, let me know in the comments or via one of the mechanisms in the description and I'll respond to you there or create a whole new video to address uh, your questions. So um, subscribe to see those questions get answered. And as always, thanks for watching.